My name is Michael King. I'm your host tonight. I'm the founder of Artful Minds. And before we get started, just a brief sentence on what Artful Minds is. Artful Minds is an online community dedicated to the nurturing artistic talents and fostering the creative growth among its members. One of our most popular events is by far the monthly critiques, which happens every second Tuesday of the month. Basically what I do is I take your images and I digitally manipulate them through different layers and we go through them step by step. So you can just see how to take your painting from where you have it to potentially where it could be. If that's something that interests you, head on over to artfulminds.ca and check out the critique or premium memberships. Thank you. Our inspirational discussion tonight is with uh, Janice Baudouin. She's a full-time Canadian artist living and working in beautiful BC with a career background in advertising and more recently interior design, which I find really interesting. She took a deep dive into the world of art over a decade ago and has never looked back. So I want to say welcome, Janice. Thank you so much for doing this interview. I really appreciate it. Hi, Michael. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Excellent. And I'm just going to share my screen here, and I'm going to go through about a dozen pieces of your work. And okay. as I do that, can you just briefly tell us how your painting journey all started? Sure. Well, I have been painting now for about 15 years. The last couple of years have been full-time. I, I grew up wanting to be an artist, but at the time, and in the smallish town that I was living in, being an artist just wasn't a practical vocation. So I took some training in media broadcasting, moved to a few cities as radio takes you, eventually landed in Vancouver, and I stayed there. From there, I worked as a copywriter. I moved into the advertising business in Vancouver, got married, had kids, loved the ad business, but it was very long long hours and super fun, but absolutely grueling. So when my kids were little, I went back to school to get my design, interior design designation part-time. I uh, ran my own business for a few years, taking foundation and art courses at Emily Carr. And then as the boys got older, I shifted into art making on a part-time basis as well. I had a little studio in the yard outside in the garden shed, which I outgrew fairly quickly. And I moved into a large studio building in North Vancouver, which is called Welsh Street Studios. It was there's nine individual studios there with a shared gallery space, and it was one. It was wonderful working there. I loved it. About a year and a half ago, we moved from North Vancouver to the interior of BC to be closer to family, and it's been a bit of an adjustment to live in a small community, but we were fortunate enough to be able to convert a garden shed on our property into an all-season studio. So I have heat and light and even when it's minus 20. So I'm happy. I can paint here and I'm here to I can support my family as well. So that's, that's nice. Yeah, that's <clears throat> Thanks for that. So the, the first question, I don't know really which comes first, but I'm going to start with your background in advertising and interior design. Do you feel hmm. that having those two backgrounds kind of influenced how you started approaching art in the first place? I think so. Yeah, definitely. Because I think I approached art with a, um, I was, I was focused on the principles of design and I, and I, even though when I was doing interior design, I was doing a lot of uh, representational sketching back in the day when I took my training, CAD was around, but we were still taught how to render in, um, and, you know, do perspectives and everything had to be, you basically had to create a room, create a chair, do a lot of drafting. So it was very technical and I was good at it and I did some amazing drawings, but I think when I started becoming interested in art, it was become uh, because I was becoming more interested in the negative spaces around the objects that I was rendering. And that sort of took me down my path into abstraction, which I find endlessly, endlessly interesting. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, especially from a design point of view. And yes. I, that's interesting that 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 is how your career influenced your art. Because whenever other people start art, they take that photo and they recreate it more or less. I guess because you did a lot of renderings, you really had no interest in that. And you were just looking through design principles more than anything. Eh? I kind of felt like I'd been there, done that. And I just didn't, it didn't interest me. I was more in, like, honestly, at, at that time, I felt like I could take a photo and I would have what I needed. I was more interested in what I, in the shapes, the abstract shapes that I was seeing looking into a room or a, you know, any sort of a setting or a vignette. I was interested in the negative shapes that I was seeing in between all the other large, large shapes, which sounds really weird, but it's kind of how it all, all started, right? Yeah, I don't think it sounds weird. I'm kind of moving that direction myself, but it's just taken me a long time to find that. But 
Yeah. I mean, with the abstract that you started with, I mean, stuff like impressionism and stuff. And whatnot didn't really appeal to you is just more of the design aspect of it. I think that's just where I ended up because I feel comfortable in that that zone. And you know, my background in advertising as well. I think my graphic, I had a bit, I have a bit of graphic design training as well. And so I think naturally when I started doing ab abstract work, that sort of graphic cadence came through in in my work. And there is a certain I like my contrasts, I like my darks, and I like my lights. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned briefly about, you know, when you look into a room, you see the abstract shapes between objects, et cetera, et cetera. That mm. said, though, when you start a piece, do you have an idea of what you're going to paint? Or is it, it, is it, or is it more of an evolutional process? Oh, it's definitely an evolutionary process. My painting process is probably infinitely frustrating to to a lot of artists. I, I basically I start the painting and it's it's this giant conversation of it's just marks, colors, shapes, and then I begin to edit. And it's like who's going to stay at the party, sort of a thing, right? And it's all this editing process of. Uh, and creating history, painting over, creating interesting shapes, finding shapes that maybe not, that aren't that interesting and turning them into different shapes, giving them an arm or a leg and uh, having them morph into others, creating depth. Yeah, it's just, it's 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 bizarre. It really is, but it's how I work. <laughs> it it kind of confuses me a little bit, I guess, in a sense, because I can see that in the the more abstract, abstract pieces that you have, much like the piece you have behind you, but I'm just going to share my screen again. And I chose mm. these ones for a reason because this evolved into what mm. I see is a landscape with two hills in the background and a tree in the front. Mm -hmm. and I, I find it hard to believe that this was a series of marks at the beginning with no intention in it. How, this is how it evolved. I'm not trying to say that it, anything you know against it, but... Mm -hmm. It was it uh, that kind of process. Yeah, they all start that way. I, wow. I, you know, I never have. I never have. I'm going to paint like this is called uh, Mesa. I'm, I'm going to paint this sort of weird tree with these weird little mountains at, at the back. That just never happened. It it just became. I know it sounds really weird, but it it just the, the painting just happened. It's fascinating. And, yeah, yeah. So underneath, and I don't know if you can zoom in on that painting, but there, I have a lot of texture in my work, and even that that area that you see, like, the, yeah, there's all sorts of colors, and I I scrape, and I I I just find the texture and the history of the work extremely interesting. And gotcha. It, this is probably an extreme simplification um, <laughs> because most of my work isn't quite that simple, but this is what this one want it to be yeah so, that's interesting after we'd, we'd moved to Kamloops and I think I was missing my green the green coast of North Vancouver and I was just filled with a lot of there was it's there was a lot of brown here in the summertime so maybe that's yeah. what I was at the time interesting that's fascinating now because you mentioned the title of this piece and we had a little conversation earlier about titles I thought that'd be a good opportunity Mesa very much suits this painting as mm. well as like if I moved to this one magical treehouse hundred mm -hmm. percent. And um, this one, <laughs> as soon as I say it, you'll never unsee it. Mixtape, guaranteed. Yeah. Now you see it, right? Uh, this yeah. one, open mic, absolutely. This, to me, seems like, I find, again, hard to believe that it was uh, conjured from and uh. marks, right? Uh, yeah. Secret Garden, like um, Patois Violets, uh, View from the Porch. I absolutely see that, right? So I guess what I want to say is I can enjoy your pieces without a doubt just the way they are. But as soon as I see your title, every time mm. it brought a smile to my, my face because now I now I understand something better. Uh, wh yeah. What are you, what's your viewpoint on titles and how do you choose them? I love titles. Titling the work is almost not quite, but almost as much fun as 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 making the work. And I think anyone who does not title their work as an artist is is missing an opportunity opportunity because particularly with abs abstract art i think that is a missed opportunity and if you're you're giving people a way in just like you mentioned if you look at a piece of art and you're just like huh i don't get it it's a bunch of shapes and it's some weird weird lines and looks like my kid could do this sort of a thing and believe me i, I get that quite a bit but when you have a title, it gives you an entrance point. It gives you an access point. So I I really enjoy titles. Um, sometimes they just, honestly, they name themselves. Other times I struggle a little bit, but I don't force it. I don't ever force it. I just, you know, 
let it be and then come back to the studio and usually a title just sort of pops into my head or the painting names itself yeah no doubt no doubt i mean i didn't even see what i thought i saw in that mixed tape piece until mm -hmm. i read the title and now i can't see i can't unsee it and along with that though it flooded back all my memories of the 80s with my Walkman and all the mixtapes. And, yep. yeah. you know, I'm, I, to me, that title is, I'm the audience for that title. Mm. Gen Z and below, I don't know if they'd really get it. Yeah, right? it's definitely a retro retro title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, because it's retro, maybe Gen Z will get it, right? But I find it yeah. quite fascinating. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, I agree with you. Without titling your work, you've lost an opportunity to actually bring someone into it, right? Sure. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Now... Being so process based in terms of uh, you kind of start just by throwing color or not throwing, but placing uh, color or marks and shapes on a canvas. Mm -hmm. When you when you're inspired, do you use that initial strategy at the beginning to get inspired, or do you have an inspiration at the start to get you going? I think it's the process that inspires me. If that makes sense, that's because sometimes I don't exactly know what I'm going to be making, but I I, I go into the studio and I'm usually in, I, I usually have a feeling or. Perhaps I don't even know what influences the work. Some, some, some. Sometimes I just start, and then I just add colors and add lines, and then I'm at this. The middle part's the worst part because the the first, you know, the first few stages are great because you're just it's just crazy. It is just fun mark making, colors. You're not really thinking about placement. You're not discerning or anything, and then you get to the middle and you're just like, oh my god, what a mess! And then you have to start making deliberate conscious design decisions and one decision influences the next decision influences the next decision influences the next decision so it's it's actually quite difficult once you get into the middle point and you try and start editing it down and um so I don't have any idea about what I want to make I, sometimes I have a palette in mind or I have a mood in mind if I'm using a horizontal canvas it inevitably turns into a landscape because there's that I can't avoid that horizon line I like to work in squares because I turn my work all the time and that way it can be any orientation that I want and I can just keep turning and turning and turning and turning until it finally feels like I have a composition that feels happy the way it is nice and i have to agree with you when i finally discovered that the process is the key uh it changed everything about the way i worked and how much i enjoyed it right and it's all about decision making mm -hmm. one step at a time but my being more representational my decision making is a little bit different than yours i would think so what do you when you look at a piece how do you decide how you need to move forward is it oh this color needs to be uh lighter grayed down or the space needs to increase i need to cut the shape into here like can you kind of step us through some of your processes after the middle stage a lot of it's color relationships so i i i'm quite experimental and i love taking chances and just putting crazy colors together and I mix all my colors as I go. I don't go in there with a, a set palette. I usually have, I mix a few, few colors and quite often I mix the colors together. So I think a lot of my process is based on how the colors are talking to one, to one another. Um, a lot of it has to do with shapes and how they interact with one another. I usually, as I said, I put in a lot of shapes and a lot of colors and a lot of marks. And then once it's all there, you, tr you try to create you know, something dy dynamic, you try to create some movement, you try to create some breathing space. It's, it's hard to describe. It's just it's something that has become intuitive to me. I appreciate you trying to. Now, Harley Brown, I remember reading one of his books, he's a pastelist. And in it, back of the book, he has this little section, but a page that distills down a good abstraction. So I want to get your take on this is basically, especially when it comes to color or values, you have one dominant and yeah. then you have a supporting one that's smaller and different. Then you have mm -hmm. another one that's a little bit smaller and different. And so every time there is an imbalance, even though there's a strength of one, there's a weaker of another, but a stronger of a smaller. Would you still agree with that? Or I'm wow. just curious. I don't ever analyze my work like that. I just have this intuitive sense and I just it feels right or it doesn't feel right and i just think color is so it's so difficult to explain or teach uh yeah it i don't know uh, for for me it's it's just you put the two together and it's either it's like oh or it's 
Oh, I love, I love that. So no, I don't, I don't go go into it with, you know, value is hugely important. Value is like way more important than, than color, to be honest. Like I, I often just to, just to, uh, as an exercise, do a completely monochromatic painting, just to prove to myself that I, I can do it. And that often springboards into another, another painting. Um, so yeah, I, but I don't, that's not how my brain works. I don't break, break it down that analytically. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, And it, it makes sense because I think we're all tuned differently towards color in terms of what you gravitate towards and what you think goes together better than another person. Right. And everyone sees color differently too. Right. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. Uh, and I had a, another great question, but it just s skipped my mind as we were talking. <laughs> Hopefully it'll okay. come back to me. One thing I noticed on Instagram, and I thought this was hilarious, is you posted something called Pink Swirl, and I'll share that right now. Oh. And what was interesting about it, though, you posted it, um, but you said, I'm really not sure about the orientation of it. And then you posted the second image, was like this, and I just kept on flipping back between the two, not deciding <laughs> what I like the best. But in the end, I think you have this version on your website. Um, how did I you do. go about deciding that this was the correct invitation? And is this how you sign your painting? So people will always hang out like this? Um, I may not, I don't think I've signed this one and I may not sign it because I think it works either way. That is one of my weirder paintings. <laughs> Um, it's definitely, definitely out there. I just felt like it could go either, either way. And then ultimately the pink just, I felt like it just needed to be on, on the top. And I kind of like, like that awkward balance of the pink just piled on top of that weird, I don't know what you want to call it, that shape. Mm -hmm. With that tiny little twig holding it all up, I just I I like the tension there. I think that's gotcha. what compared made... to when it's flipped, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. Um, I remember my question uh, because your your talk about values is so important, and I have to agree with you. Ninety eight percent of the time, they're one of the most important things. But then you get into the work of like Monet. You take one of his uh, landscapes and mm -hmm. take it black and white. You have maybe three values in there. And I was wondering if you've ever taken the opportunity to see if you can create a tight value painting just using color. Have you ever tried that? Yeah, yeah, I I have. I I just I think I tend to like a lot of contrast in my work though, so it can be done. But I don't think I'm drawn to that. Gotcha. Uh, you know, I probably do it as an exercise or a study, but it's not I'm not my preferred way to work for sure. Now, because you, have, I really don't know your process. I don't know how you paint, but it's. It can't be just all brush work. There's probably a lot of tools involved, but do you have mm. anything that you've just made that you have or you picked up that you just keep on using a lot of for your tools? I have a spoon that I use sometimes. So, see, I've never heard of anybody using a spoon. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's got, it's a little pointy, um, um, it's, it's just got the gr a great, it, it, I kind of use it as, as as a palette knife and I just use it as, as a scraper. So yeah, I use a lot of normal tools. I use, you know, brushes, of course, and uh, those wedges. I like those wedges a lot because sometimes I mix cold wax into my paint and those wedges are lovely to work with. It's like, you know, spreading icing on, on a cake. And I love that smooth finish that, that they that they give. But I do a lot of scraping. So I work with palette knives quite a bit. Um, I don't ever get in there with my fingers, although you'd never guess that when I come out of the studio because my husband laughs at me because I paint all over my face. I think what I do is I work with gloves, but I think I'm not thinking about it. And I just, you know, do this and the paint's on my gloves and it's in my hair. And I work with oil very conscious about being of being uh you know trying to keep the paint off my face and yet i continue to get it on my face so Anyways. yeah yeah well as soon as you get oil paint on your hands it's it's everywhere right oh yeah yeah, yeah. I know. that's so funny <laughs> we talked a bit about mark making but not much now mm -hmm. i mean with your with your work i can see mark making being very important but also not important because sometimes you want it very flat and subdued and other times mm -hmm. you want it very thick and mark ish but do you tend to lean towards wanting to use big, bold marks over subtle ones? or um, I like having big, bold marks, but I also like the subtle ones as well, um, because I, I think mark making is hugely important in abstract work because it is your language. It's how it's what makes my work different from your work, from another abstract artist's work, um, because we all make marks in different ways. So yeah, I do like, I do like making bold, bold marks. I think my work is 
shifting a little bit. I was doing a lot of really bold, large shapes, dark lines, but I think my work is starting to shift a little bit and, and it's not becoming busier, but I think it's becoming a little bit more sensitive. I'm trying to, yeah, just incorporate looser shapes instead of these more defined shapes. And that's something that is just coming. I think I'm trying to combine work that I had previously done, which was quite loose and gestural along to the work that is quite strong shapes, strong lines, very graphic looking. And I'd like to merge those two. That's what I'm working towards right now. It's a slow process though. Yeah, no doubt. So when you talk about less defined, for example, we could use the painting you have behind you in terms of the shapes, how they kind of blend into each other. Mm -hmm. Compa now compared to the stuff I just showed, which like with your mixed tape, uh, yeah. it's very strong and obvious of what those shapes are. And you, mm -hmm. so now I guess you're trying to mix the two, right? I'd like to. I don't know whether they, they belong together or not, but I'm just going to see if if I can make them. I'm not going. I'm not going to force it, but I I think there's definitely people like this type of work better because I think it's it's easier to access. I still like doing my really large graphic, big bold shapes. I just I love I love doing them. There is a, there is a smaller market for that. It's a more contemporary market for sure. I I love doing both. So I don't know. Maybe maybe they will continue to both be different series. Maybe they don't belong together. I don't know. I'm just going to see what what happens. Interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Now, I love your term about it's easier to access. Because I don't think mm -hmm. artists really think about their work like that. They get the mindset that why aren't anybody interested in my work? Why am I not getting awards? Why am I not doing this or that? But the way you put it, it's easier to access. I don't think anybody's really thinking like that. And I, I, I really appreciate that. That's interesting. I think that abstract art, especially, you need to give people an entry point yeah. because unless they have an, an entry point, then they're just, if they don't understand it, they're just going to walk by it or dismiss it. It's just like, I don't get it. So, you know, I, I'm just going to ignore that because that's, that's just weird. Or it makes people feel unintelligent if they can't, if they don't, don't get it. It's just like, oh, I, I guess I should be able to see something in that and I don't see it. It means I'm dumb, but it's not. It's so I think, yeah, I think being able to access the art is super important. And whether that's through a title or whether it's through educating someone, you know, like I think I mentioned, you know, I think every ab abstract artist has have, had someone say, oh, you know, I could do that or my kid could do that. And, and as tempting as it is to say, okay, well, invite me to your next show. I'd love to see it. Or I'd love to see your kid's next, next show. I usually try and take that opportunity to, if they're open to it, to educate them in some way about, you know, what abstract art is and what the process is and, and uh, give them a way in. Sometimes they don't want to hear it, but that's fine. Yeah, and we we had a semi conversation about this be, before we started, and I think it all comes down to, yeah, they feel dumb. They put their hackles up. There's that fear there that they need to understand it, but they can't, and so they just dismiss it and are angry about it because yeah. that's easier, right? Yeah, it's like jazz music. I I think that jazz music and abstract art. I see so many some similarities. People are terrified of jazz music because they don't get it, right? It's just like, oh, there's this crazy melody, and it does. I can't follow it, and Abstract art is exactly the same way. And I think that's what I love about it is, is it takes you on this crazy journey and it's the not knowing that I really like. like what's going to happen next? Um, where is this painting going to end up? It's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. No. And I laugh at your remarkable jazz because there's every year, at least once a year, right? I try jazz and it's just, I, I can't get this. <laughs> and, but at least I'm trying. Maybe when I'm getting to my 80s, I'll finally appreciate it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And there's different levels of jazz. I mean, there's uh, some jazz that I I, I don't particularly like either, but... Now, with your work, we talked about the start is exciting, the mid or uh, and uh, sort of the end where you start making decisions about everything going. That being said, though, how do you know you're done? Like, you can be finished one day, come back in the next day and think, oh, I need I need this here. And that, that sounds like it could be an infinite process. How do you really know you're done? It sometimes seems like an infinite process. I keep at it, and I spend a lot of time just sitting looking at the work. And I just keep turning it and adjusting it and looking at it and then leaving and then coming back. And, and when the time comes where there's, there's nothing else that I want to do to the painting, there's nothing that I would change, then I usually declare it done. Sometimes I'm wrong and I'll do that and I'll come back a week later and I'm like, oh, you are not done at all. So um, it can be an infinite process, but generally when I feel like I, I okay, 
I don't think I want to do anything else. That's when I feel like it's done. Gotcha. Yeah. Those, those damn feelings, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there must be situations, well, I guess not must, but perhaps there's situations where you have to get, I don't know, six paintings off to a gallery and you're yep. a little behind and this one's giving you an issue, but it has to go at the door. There has to be some point that you got to avoid all that and just say it's done and let it dry and chip it off, no? Or you just leave it behind? I just leave it behind. If it's not ready to go out the door, then I I just don't don't send it. So I I do work at on with on many paintings simultaneously because I do work in in oils and and I like having giving them a, a bit of time to set up. So if I am working towards a show or I'm shipping work to a gallery, my studio is not huge, but I can usually fit three large panels and maybe six medium panels on one wall because I work on the wall. And it's kind of, it, it sounds like it's a bit of a production line, but it really isn't. So, you know, I just sort of work, work along. And sometimes one is coming along a little bit better than the others. And then I get focused on that and I finish it. Other times, you know, they're all sort of at the, at the same stage. They all have their own per personality. But when I'm working in series, then I, I see, so usually there's a shape or a line quality, or there's something that is repeating itself in all the, the di different paintings. And Sometimes one of them just doesn't, is not up, up for it and it just doesn't go. I don't ship anything out the door unless I think it's, it's ready to go. That's good to know. That's good to know. But there is, there is a lot of pressure involved when, when you're, when you're getting ready for a show though, for sure, for sure. So I always overshoot it. Okay. I need, I'm going to paint 10, even though I only need seven sort of a thing. Right. And that way you've got three that can, oh. yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And you've kind of answered my question already about, do you just work on one until it's done or do you work on many? But it seems like, yeah, you would line them up on the wall and you kind of work and you get to a point yeah. where you're done working on this one for now or it's giving you frustration. So you move on. And then the development of these other two, three, four will bring you back to this one fresh kind of yeah. idea, right? Exactly. And and I think that helps me from overworking as well, because when I first started painting, I overworked all the time because I would just become hyper-focused on this one painting. And I would get so frustrated because I wasn't able to resolve it and fix it. And and so I now, I if I've only got two or three paintings in the studio and one's acting up, I actually, I turn it around and put it in the timeout corner and it stays there until we're ready to be on speaking terms again. And, and that way I don't get angry at it and overwork it. And yeah, it's just, just the way it, way it goes. And then usually if I look at it a week later, I look at it with completely fresh eyes and it's. Yeah. Yeah. Different. You can see it. I do agree. Exactly. That's interesting though, that you hadn't always worked in this multi painting process. You started stuck with one at the beginning. When did, when do you think that, you changed and you started working on many to make it easier for yourself. I think when I got a larger studio, when I was working in my garden shed in North Van, um, I only really had space for one painting and it was on an easel. And so I I just worked to what I had the space and I didn't really, it didn't really occur to me to, have to do more than one because I thought artists just, you did a painting and then you were done. And then you did another painting and then you were done. And when I moved into Well Street, I had all this space and it was like, oh, I can do more than one at the same time. This is this is a lot of fun. So it just, it's just an evolution, I think. One of the questions that came up and I thought was interesting because you're an interior designer. So you really get the ins and outs of what's trendy, what's popular. So do you ever work on color combinations based on popular decor? color or predictions? I don't just as a rule because I never do paintings to match the couch ever. Uh, I worked and I would I would specify paintings uh, for people all the time um, so it would match the decor but I tend to avoid trends. I'm, tr I'm sure I'd sell a lot more work if I worked in trendy colors and trendy palettes but no that's just not what I want to do. I've done, been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. See, I find it really interesting though, as an interior designer, you would spec painting based on the color of the couch or the room or blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, but it's, it's what clients want. Yeah. I would, I wouldn't encourage them to do that, but if they weren't able to choose a painting on their own, I would suggest things. And, but it's so hard to choose art for, for, for someone else. So essentially if you're putting a room room together to be photographed, it's, it's just easier to find something that matches the couch and because art is personal. And so I would definitely counsel my clients to, you know, find meaningful art 
that was personal to them, but quite often there wasn't the budget or uh, they weren't comfortable with it. And I would sometimes suggest pieces, but most of the times it was just easier to match the sofa, (laughs) unfortunately. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I guess because there's an intimidation factor when you talk about choosing art for your home, that's not yes. something really we've ever considered, right? And I see a lot of work these days that interior designers pick and it is, it's very safe. It's, you know, trendy colors, simple. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is safe and I can see why people, why they choose it because it's easy, easy to work, to work with. And, and that way the art doesn't steal the show because if you're an your designer you want your design to be all you know everything sort of complementing one another you don't want the painting to steal the show right yeah yeah i could see that now on the flip side though i mean i'm delving a little bit into your career as an interior designer but just for this one question if you'll indulge yes. me is have anybody ever given you a piece of art and saying you have to match this the corridor or this room to this painting uh, yeah, that's happened a couple of times. Um, people have a piece of work that they love. And that's actually really fun. I love doing that because you're kind of working with, there, there's 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 your palette. Because when I would choose palettes for people, quite often I would just, uh, we would choose a piece of fabric and we would use the colors in the fabric that was maybe on a cushion or something like this. And that was the palette for the entire room. So it was just basically the same thing, except I had a whole painting to work with. So yeah, I actually like doing that unless the painting was really hideous. And then, but and it's a struggle, right? It's a struggle, but you just sort of go with it. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Uh, previously, you mentioned about how you don't premix colors or anything like that. Mm. Uh, but then how do you, hmm, I'm trying to phrase this, how do you start the process of choosing the color that you're going to re- need for the first initial marks? Or is it, I don't care, I just want to get something on there and then everything will flow towards it? I don't care. It's the I don't care. <laughs> um Usually I will tone a canvas with, um, I'll, with something with, you know, um, an ochre or a blue or, um, some sort of a wash of some, some sort just to get something to respond to. And then I will start marking and I won't even think about the colors. Sometimes I'll just get my RF oil, oil sticks out and just go to town and just have fun. And then it'll just start to speak to me at some, at some, some point and I'll be like, okay, I, I think I'm, I'm working towards using more sophisticated colors, more, um, grayed down colors. I, I like to mute, mute my colors and, and, um, you know, take something out of the tube and just mix six or seven different colors with it just to see what I can get. I find that infinitely interesting. Oh, without a doubt, right. It'd be just amazing with every, every range. It'd be fantastic, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. It seems like you start a lot with toning the canvas, mm-hmm. um, which is a great strategy. I could see that. But have you ever just went in with your straight oil sticks and just done line to figure out anything? Yep, I have. I have actually. I, I do that from time, time to time. I Again, a lot of it, my, my first instinct when I'm just doing mark mark making is if the, if the canvas is vertical, it's almost like it's a figure. Like I just want to do vertical lines and that's how I usually start with the RF oil, oil, oil sticks, just some really bold lines. I don't really like doing the horizontal, the land, the landscape format for some reason. I don't know. It just doesn't really speak, speak to me. And, and that's the thing I love about squares is you do square and you can, you know, you can put some marks on and it, it's not necessarily a horizon line. It's not necessarily a figure. It can be whatever you want. You can just keep turning it. And that sometimes, again, how, how it starts. And sometimes it'll, I'll just do some really bold mark, mark making with a, with those juicy oil, oil sticks. And most of it will get covered up, but there might be maybe just one or two lines that are peeking through that I just can't, can't cover. Yeah. That, that's interesting. I could, I, for sure, I could see that happening. And then with the square, it's just, it's freedom. Even if you, you were to put a horizontal line or a vertical line, it's not necessarily mm-hmm. anything, right? That's, that's interesting. So maybe, maybe some advice of people who want to start abstract painting, it mm-hmm. might be more freeing to start with the square proportion rather than any other proportion. I, I would suggest that. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, well, I think like a, a 12 by 12 square is kind of the ideal size when you just, when you're just starting, because it's not so intimidating. It's big enough that you can make bold marks and, and get gestural, but it's not so big that you have to, you know, <laughs> You use your entire arm and it doesn't use as much paint either. So yeah, yeah, I I would suggest, you know, a a good way to start with abstracts is just get some 12 by 12 panels, gesso them and go to town and see what happens. Challenge accepted. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to see how that works. Yeah, for sure. Now we talked, because the proportions reminded me of composition. I mean, there's always these ideas and not necessarily rules, but concepts about 
composition. Do you ever go in there intentionally and think about composition at all, whether it's rule thirds, high horizon, low horizon, diagonals, et cetera, or you just kind of ignore that and let it evolve? I think about composition a lot, but I don't think of it in the traditional way. I think I think that is that is always in the back of my head. It's always there, but I'm not consciously thinking of it. The rule of thirds, it's just something that is, I just do so automatically now. I think with my design training, it's just something that is very intuitive at, at, at this point. So, and I like, I like challenging the rules of composition as well. I, I think that's really interesting is to just sort of, I don't know, try something different. Uh, you could tell whether it work, works or not right, right away, but just doing something a little bit different that maybe cha challenges the eye and it's just unusual. I like being experimental. Now, I think this is a kind of a difficult question. It's open to uh, interpretation, but what do you think it takes to be an artist? What do I think it takes to be an artist? You have to love love to paint. You have to be persistent. You have to be, you have to have a thick skin, I think. If you have to be an abstract artist, for sure. There's so many qualities to being, being an artist. I think any art, any creative person, whether they're a musician or um, a writer or an artist, I think you have to be able to develop your own voice and stick to it and be persistent because it's so easy to stop because you don't think you're good enough or somebody said something online that you you know they didn't like i mean yeah no one's gonna like everyone's work all all the time so you just have to let it you know having a thick a thick skin it's it's awful because the artists are all sense we're all sensitive souls and yet we, we have to develop this really thick skin if we want to succeed in the art world it's sad but it's true yeah it's kind of like artists is an oxymoron in the sense that we want to create all this artwork but we have to show it to other people to support us and we don't want the feedback. We just want them to buy it kind of thing, right? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, it takes a lot of bravery to be an artist too, because you're basically, you're you're putting your soul on the wall, right? Being brave, being persistent and, and not letting criticism affect you. It's hard. It's easy, yeah. easier said than done. Oh, without a doubt, right? And especially when you hit the uh, imposter syndrome wall, right? Yeah. That's always a difficult one. How about yourself? How many times have you hit that wall? Oh, many times. <laughs> many times. <laughs> I, I love hearing other artists say that because it yeah. just lets us know we're not alone, right? Yeah, no, that wall and I, we're, we're very familiar with one another. So, uh, I think it's just part and parcel with creating. Yeah. Everybody, it happens to everybody. You can't, can't avoid it. Yeah, without a doubt. And now I, what I find interesting is because you have a background in, in design. Myself, I as well do. I trained as an industrial designer, so I've been through all that process. Other artists that I know have, that have a design background, whether it's architect or something like that, I always mm -hmm. find the conversations with them interesting when they talk about creating the art because they understand it's a it's a process, it's a it's a movement forward, a step back moving forward, step back, probably because of the challenges we have with making a design and having a client get feedback on it and altering it based on this awful feedback they always give, 100% all the time, and then moving forward with it in a creative way that helps the project. Do you find, uh, because of your profession, that painting is an easier process than maybe what you see through other artists or students? Sorry, can you repeat that last part of the question? If I can remember it. <laughs> do, you, do you find that because of your design background, you, you have a better... Uh, understanding and you find it, e I don't want to say easier to paint uh, than say other artists that you might know or students that you have. Oh yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, yes, yes. And, and no, I, I enjoy, I think, I think my, my design background has definitely helped me in, in, in my art making for sure. And I think the one thing I enjoy about it is I'm not following a client brief, so I can, I can do what I want sort of a thing. And I think it's provided me with the tools and the, the basic understanding and principles of design that I can just automatically apply them without really thinking about them. We were talking about the rule of thirds and mm -hmm. I was thinking, yeah, I guess I do apply that all, all the time, but I don't consciously think I'm using those print principles. So, you know, all the principles of design in any design, whether it's interior design, industrial design, graphic design, they're all the same, whether you're painting or whether you're, you know, creating a, a magazine ad or a logo or something like that. So yeah, it's definitely an advantage for sure, because that sort of is always in the back of your mind when you're creating the work. Gotcha. Yeah. Because it's just instilled in this for so yeah. long, right? Yeah. 
Now we talked about uh, size you recommended for people to start with 12 by 12, but with yourself, do you have an average size that you pretty much go to for your paintings? I think I use, I usually 36 by 36 is a nice size for me. I worked really big last year. I did some pieces on uh, unstretched canvas and shipped them to a gallery. And those were the biggest pieces I'd ever done. And they were like, I think 60 by 48 or something like that. They were, they were big, they were rolled, but I think, you know, I'm most comfortable. I like a 36 by 36 or a 40 by, by 40. That seems to be a, a nice, a nice size size for me. Anything bigger than that. And it starts to get a bit unwieldy in the studio and I have to really scale up my tools and, uh, and it uses a lot of paint, <laughs> a lot of paint. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that last statement pretty much predicted my next question because I've recently started going from my smaller plein air pieces to bigger studio pieces. And I find the biggest hurdle for me is just the amount of paint I need. It's like, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. Knowing that you just jumped larger, were you surprised by the amount of paint you had to use on that 60 by 48 compared yes. to like a 30 by 60 by okay. Four of them. <laughs> Good. <Yes>. I'm happy. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, it was it was it, I I had no idea. Yeah, so I I I think I've I think I might have used a little bit more cold wax in those pieces because the cold wax helped things spread out a bit. And I think with the really large ones, I may have started with some acrylic underpainting in those because I find with acrylic painting, it, paint it not only dries faster, but it's cheaper and you can put some less expensive paints on the lower the lower uh, layers and and then work, work up to the goils on top. Now, I'm glad you brought up acrylics because that was a question that I forgot previously is, have you ever, and obviously you have, just work an acrylic up to the mid-stage and then go directly into oil? But it, obviously it sounds like you have, right? But it's not a common yeah. occurrence. Yeah, I prefer to work in oils just because I uh, I just in, I just enjoy it a lot a lot more. But you know you have to be practical. And, and when I'm working on on really big big pieces, I've even started big pieces with house paint. What? No just, way. Yeah, the, the lower levels to start them with just just to get some marks on the canvas. And like if I'm working on something really really big, it's all covered up. And you know you can put. So, you know, I might start start with house paint and then put some acrylics on top and then finish with, with the oils. And and usually it's, I mean, some of my paintings are, you know, six to 12 layers thick. So you, you never even, the house paint is basically acting as gesso, but it's there for a reason because I, I responded to the shape, shape that was there and it created yeah. another shape, which, which made me create another shape. So it did serve a purpose, even though you don't even, the viewer doesn't even see it. Yeah, for sure, right? And when you first said house paint, my brain said, oh my God, can you even do that? And obviously you could because house paint is just an acrylic polymer, correct? Just acrylic latex. Yeah, yeah. so it's cheaper than art store acrylic. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's kind of neat. Hmm. Hey, got me thinking. <laughs> the wheels are turning. <laughs> no doubt. How many samples can I get just to work with that? That's interesting. You can get you can get those little samples at Benjamin Moore or Sher Sherwin-Williams, those little tiny little pots and stuff like that yeah that's right the quality, the quality is terrible you wouldn't ever want to do a painting because they dry really flat and yeah and yeah the quality is awful but just if just if you're working huge just a way to get some color on on, on the canvas and give you something to respond to not something yeah, i do sure. on a regular basis but with with huge paintings yeah i do that i do do that occasionally yeah that's uh, that, i like that that's great advice interesting now in your career from starting to now has there been an artist that's kind of influenced you throughout the whole time a living artist uh it doesn't have to be living or even in general stages throughout your career i think this is one of the questions that you gave me ahead of time and i actually wrote down a quote there's an artist named amy Silman, and she is she's an american artist she's a living artist and i actually just love her work it's really weird but it really speaks to me and i love she's very intelligent and I love the way she writes about process I actually have a couple quotes from her because she challenges the status quo all the time um the, one of her quotes is I want to expand the question of when something is done I want to vex the ending I want to mess around that I like the idea that if you make a work that has no clear ending then you must play with the ending because if you don't you're not highlighting the weird lovely openness of abstraction I just think that's it's so brilliant. She just was able to put into words of what a lot of um, a lot of artists, I think, ab abstract artists who work the way I do, are feeling when when they approach the canvas. 
And there's another one that really speaks to me as well. And she says, you can make a beautiful thing, but there's not a problem in it. I like the idea of doing a thing, wrecking a thing, questioning uh, questioning it to the point where you have pushed it to the edge and then recuperating it. I know that sounds really bizarre and quite sick, but it's it's like, like I don't know. It's just like this puzzle, right? You, you yeah. just, yeah. So yeah, how else would you develop a painting if you can't destroy what's there, even though you found beauty in it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and that, that and that's a lot of what I do is construction and deconstruction and rebuilding. And so she's someone who definitely influenced. I I, I like her writing almost as much as I like her work. Richard Diepenkorn, brilliant. I mean, he was the master master of color and composition, and I, I never get tired of looking at his, his work. There's an artist named Chuta Kimura. He's not very well known, but I believe he was. Japanese and he lived in France and I love his work I happened across it online and um, his work's amazing I just love it so much it really speaks to me wow I'm gonna have to look him up he's not very well 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 known um, I'm trying to think of who else um, I mean yeah Philip Guston um, who else so many so many a lot of a lot of the American abstract expressionists really speak to me I'm losing her name right now Oh, Joan Mitchell, of course. Love Joan Mitchell. Mm. I'd love to be able to paint, paint like her. Yeah. I think we all say that about one artist or another, right? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for sure. But I don't think he ever can. You can always do a copy. You try to get in their minds, but um, there's just something about the way they paint, right? You can you can try, but I don't think you can ever recreate that, eh? And so. I do think that's, that's one advantage that abstract artists have over other artists. Uh, the work's hard to copy because I don't think you can ever recreate the essence of a brushstroke or the gesture. And I, I think it's a lot. It's, a, it's very difficult to copy abstract art. The way, the way a mark was made and, and not knowing how, how the mark was made, whether it was created with, by scra scraping away, whether it was layered, uh, it's possible, but I, I, I don't see a lot of ab abstract art copied as much as representational art. Failure. We've all done it. Whether oh, yeah. it's a personal failure or what we consider to be failures uh, in other people's eyes. But how do you handle like rejections from shows or having your gallery call after six months and say, you know what, I think we need to swap out these paintings. Um, mm. do, you, do you get that sense of defeativeness to you? And how do you overcome that? Uh, well, I think this probably goes back to the thick skin is um, I think it's just part and parcel. If you want to sell your work, you just have to develop a thick thick skin and realize that sometimes things are not going to go your way. And, um, you know, can't really let it bother you. It's kind of like water off a duck's, duck's back. Yeah. And, yeah. But yeah, it, it, it happens and we all have to deal with it. And I think a lot of artists, when they when they do face rejection, it's just like, oh, well, I'm I'm not any good at what that. At a painting, I'm just going to quit. But um, I do think that there is an audience for almost every art piece, piece of art. So, yeah, you just have to keep going. Be persistent. Yeah, absolutely. You never know when the time's going to come. That said, if you ever have art returned to you from a gallery, do you just ship it off to a different gallery? Um, I haven't had that happen yet. Oh. So I'm hoping it doesn't. <laughs> Um, I have I have some great relationships with with the galleries that I'm in right now, and so yeah, knock oh, on wood. Right. That's fantastic. <laughs> and so we're coming to the end here. We have a couple of minutes left, but there's two questions that I always ask the guests is, and the first one is, um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? The best piece of advice that I've ever been given probably stay curious, take risks, don't settle, and just keep keep pushing and I I don't think I'll ever settle into one particular um, style of work because my work is constantly evolving and you know it's definitely not for ev everybody it's quite experimental and I I get that not every it doesn't speak to ev everyone but it speaks to me and it speaks to a lot of other people um, out there as well so yeah I just I just keep trying new things yeah no that's great that's great. Now, on the flip side of that, and hopefully it can be different, what's your top piece of advice uh, that you, you would give others? Top piece of advice I would give others? Uh, painters, we're talking about? Yes, for sure. Yeah. You know, asking for Anne Landers' advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say paint, 
just paint, get your, get your 10,000 hours in. Um, that's the only way you're going to get better is just keep painting and um, stop comparing your work to other people's work. Um, work on developing your own visual language. And that, that just comes in time. You just have to, you have to make a lot of work. And uh, I, I see so many artists that just, you know, they create these pieces and they put them out for sale. And if they don't sell immediately, it's just like, oh, well, you know, I guess this is, isn't for me, but I mean, we all, most of us, most of us who have been painting for a while have a lot of failed paintings. I, I just went through this bucket, this um, Tupperware tin of, of just pieces on paper. And I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe I've kept all these, but they were, I was doing a, a 100 paintings pro pro mm. project and there were a hundred paintings on paper there. And some of them were awful, but they got me to where I am now. So that would be my advice is to just paint and scroll less and paint more. Stop comparing yourself to other people. I think that is comparison is it's terrible. It's defeating. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't stress how much that first piece of advice, how important that is. Just paint, create, 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 get it out of you. Yeah. And don't feel like you have to share it. I mean, honestly, you don't have to share it all just paint and if it's terrible that's fine just let it be terrible and just paint something else and if you want to share it fine but don't feel like you have to share it. don't feel like it has to be amazing just make mistakes be willing to make mistakes and just just do it and then eventually when you continue to paint and paint and paint you will develop your own your own um, voice absolutely that's right thank you so much for that um, you can find Janice online at JaniceBaldwinArt.com and you can find her on Instagram with her handle JanCat. I never got into that <laughs> conversation, but I find that fantastic. So I want to say a deep felt thank you very much for this conversation. You've inspired me. You and are I, and uh, I, re I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you, Michael. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. All right, everyone take care. Thank you for joining us and enjoy your evening, Janice. Bye-bye, you too. Thanks.